In our theory, dream and reality, I am today um, making a little interview with one of the project leaders, Professor Anne Bertimer, who has been living in Sweden now for quite some time. This is not going to be an ordinary interview, Anne. It's more going to be a conversation between two individuals who went to know each other and from the very beginning felt some kind of mutual respect and also care for each other and who have now been intensively engaged in a research work for six months together in something called the Dialogue Project. During these six months, Anne, we had a lot of time to experience various kinds of difficulties to surmount them and also to find solutions to them. There were days we quarreled, there were days we just hated each other, <laughs> and there were days when we loved each other and really feel we fly together on a common goal. We have talked about all this. However, I've always been astonished by your very vivid intelligence, by your unlimited knowledge, and also by your wide grasp of people's events and tendencies over space and time. So now I'm going to ask you, Anne Bertimer, who are you? Because you are certainly not an ordinary Irish farmer's daughter. <laughs> From where comes this inner urge of creating? And what in your life motivates you to hurry, to think, and to work as you do? <clears throat> That's quite a question, Chris. <laughs> That's an embarrassing question. <laughs> When I talk about being an Irish farmer's daughter, I, I say that because people don't know where I come from. And I feel that influences a lot of what I believe and feel and, you know, dream also. My biggest dreams come when I'm walking barefoot on the grass at home, mm -hmm. <laughs> taking care of the home and so on. Um, what is the origin? Who knows? I know that one of the deepest influences in my life is, of course, faith. You know, and I take that as a gift. I can't explain or defend it. It's just a gift and I'm very grateful for it. So when dreams stir within me, I try to respond in a responsible way to them. Some of them are most unrealistic, you know, but they can only be understood in that way. And I think the project and my whole time in Sweden, you know, it, it, it really doesn't make any sense from rational standpoint. It, it only makes sense in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, in a way. I'm long distance from measuring up to my own criteria of really being a Christian woman. Uh, but I love to dream that it's possible and it's a horizon one never attains. So in the intellectual life, there is a, there is a big uh, need for, I think, a gospel spirit about what we do. Because in the world of thought, you absolutely need generosity and trust so that we move together toward a fuller comprehension of things, you know. So what else is it? Okay, I, I had a lot of experience taking care of the home at home. I, we had a large family and we weren't very rich and mm. my parents depended on me to, to sort of keep the house in order and have meals on the table and so on. So um, I feel that there is a job of homemaking in a way with ideas as well as with these big questions of policy and planning and so on. So there's a good deal of experience and there's a good deal of faith behind what I dream. You're trying to kind of, of combine the woman's feeling for a home together with a man's rational of thinking. Is that I true? Suppose. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. I'm not too keen on the stereotypes, but society has given us those stereotypes. Um, could you tell me something about the people who inspired you most, uh, th those who have known or you've been reading about or, or you just gave you big feelings? Yeah, yeah obviously the first is my parents, mm -hmm. you know, my mother in her way and my father in his way. Mother is dead but father is still alive and he was a very strong influence in my life. And I, I recognize all of the costs and benefits of allowing that to be the case. but. I have been and still am very much the dutiful daughter. <laughs> and uh, he's a wonderful man and I'm fortunate. Uh, he's an Irish farmer who were very active in the cooperative movement yes. in its beginnings. And yes. who still is. Still is, very yes. much in national planning policy and rationalization of agriculture. But he was a farmer. I mean, he learned it on the soil rather than from universities. Did you learn uh, it from him too? Or were you more influenced by your mother's kind of work and attitude? Well, I was outside always, between the cows and the calves, and helping Dad, you see, because my older sister was in the house. So uh, I learned about agriculture 
really with him and my brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, technology was not very well developed, so we milked the cows ourselves and so on. And uh, I learned about rotation of crops, for example, by seeing how things happened in the fields. And I saw erosion. I also saw uh, reclamation. You know, we went into this very big farm, and there were 200 acres of it that had been allowed to become almost a mountain, we called it. And Dad rotivated and cultivated that 200 acres himself mm -hmm. with some grants and so on. But he experimented with different things, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw all that happening. So agriculture, per se, was of interest even before I learned physical geography. But later, it was the business of agrarian society that was of more interest to me because of the work in France and so on. Uh, I got very angry about some of the models of peasant society that I read about in anthropology books, for example. And uh, I felt that these were being written from a sort of scientific outsider point of view. Mm. And uh, they didn't describe at all how it felt to grow up as a child in an agricultural society. You know? mm -hmm. So there, there was a double interest, as it were, the physical, the ecological, and then the social, which came later mm. when I started reading books about it. So, so uh, this book that you wrote about French society, society milieu, French geography, this arose from your interest from your childhood and the contact with the foreign culture and, and so on? I think so, Chris. You see, at Washington, Seattle, <coughs> during graduate studies, it was regional science. It was, you know, Torsten Hagerstrand had visited the department a few years before I began graduate work. In which uh, time was it? The, he, uh, I, I, came, I began in 62, mm -hmm. and uh, he had been there in 59, and the cutting edge was quantification, regional science, economic geography. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been asked by a group to teach a course in social geography at Seattle University. And so I came up and asked the professors, what is social geography? And they said, oh, listen, lady, we got that out of our systems long ago. Never heard, you know, we don't want to hear about that. So I wrote letters all over to people that I felt, you know, wrote things which would come under the rubric of social geography. And um, I just know uh, that time you, you were a nun. Yes. Weren't they surprised to have a nun who was a letter from a nun and was writing about geography and so on? Did you create a certain atmosphere around your person? Oh, yes. I think everybody was so amused and I was so lost <laughs> because I couldn't even speak. I didn't understand what they were saying to me. I couldn't type, you know. It was just uh, Alice in Wonderland. And, yeah. But everybody was so kind. I mean, they didn't, they didn't show me that I was such an oddball. So. Uh, but the encouragement, I think Professor Marvin Mikeso is the one I have to thank most in addition to my own advisor in Washington, who was Morgan Thomas. And they allowed me, really, to, to go my own route. I, I kind of objected to the monopoly there was mm. on thought, just from this one law-seeking regional science approach. And the model of, of humanity was economic man optimizing mm -hmm. and so on. So I think I found the French and started cultiva cultivating that reading at night as a kind of hobby. But the French geography. The French geography. The old tradition from Vidal de la Blache and right. the old. Right. And I loved Max Soar. Yes. One of my greatest pains was to see his necrology. I wanted to meet the man, but he died before. He came too late. Yeah, but I think they wrote about society and milieu in a way that came close to my own experience in Ireland. You know, and my own professor in Cork was a very inspiring man, and he had that holistic approach, you mm -hmm. know, humanity and resources, uh, gently <laughs> with each other, not one dominating the other and so on. Mm -hmm. And especially the role of values and beliefs and uh, traditions that are passed on, you know, orally. Uh, they're very important in agrarian society and still are. So the French were sensitive to that, so I really... I love that, and they allowed me to do my dissertation on some foundations for social geography, primarily referring to the French work. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened then? Then I got a grant to go and study in France and Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I it was to study philosophy at Louvain in yes. Belgium. And uh, I was weak on philosophy, so I spent a year with existentialism, phenomenology, and some critical philosophy of science. And I thought after that year, you know, if I had approached the study of classical French geography with some better philosophy background, I would have done it entirely differently. Mm -hmm. But then I might have written something that nobody could read. Yes. You know? So this is really a doctor's dissertation. It's, it's a naive questioning of how could a geographer go about this thing. So Belgium was, was really an eye-opener because there you had Maoists and, and Marxists and existentialists and a lot of really social activism you know, liberation theology and oh, all this structural change, you know, within religious milieu particularly. And that's where I learned the whole business of dialogue, I think, mm -hmm. you know, to allow each stance to articulate itself, 
You know, without... Some... You were also very struck by the events of 1968 in Paris. You s very often refer to them. Yes. Why were they so important to you? Well, you see, I was there just before 68, in a way. It was 66. You knew the feelings and the ambience yes. and the academic milieu? The great hope, you know, the great excitement. We can do something, you know, and we're able to articulate it now. And then it seemed like nothing happened. It just seemed like all of that criticism got absorbed and the, the dinosaur just got up and took a shake and got bigger and then laid down again, you know. And it, it was such an insult to, to heart as well as mind for a number of those people. Mm. So I've, I've really felt very strongly about the post-68. Now, do you think you have a special kind of philosophy? I've, ha I've got the feeling that sometimes you are being very Bertimer. <laughs> and this is very special for you. What, uh, well, could you explain a little of it? Uh, or have you been influenced by political movements, for instance? Oh, yes. I mean, I must have inherited a tremendous amount of anti-colonial feeling. Yes, <laughs> being an it. Irish. Yes. yes. I must have absorbed a great deal of scholastic philosophy and categorical logic, you know, and so on, Dominican tradition. I must have uh, absorbed and internalized a lot of positive thought. You know, the methods we learned in, in sociology, demography, geography, and so on, they were very much a, a rigorous positivist sort of line of thought. And I think I still am when I come to empirical work. Mm -hmm. You know, I really believe in following the rules there. But the strongest influence lately has been, I think, critical philosophy and existentialism. But that's in the world of thought, you see. And one of the biggest th things I would like to do in my life is to bridge that separation between mind and heart, mm. between truth, in a way, and goodness. There, there are two separate worlds now. To, to, and our university structures have all pursued truth in its own way. I should say, producing truthful statements. <laughs> Uh, because this business of truth is a metaphysical issue we don't talk about. But questions of what's right and wrong, what's good or bad, you know, uh, they're not to confuse the fumigated <laughs> intellectual thing here. So I think we have a split of what we think and how we are. Mm -hmm. And I would like a better harmony between those, you know, and to see that, in fact, the journey toward truth and the journey toward goodness are, in fact, complementary journeys. You know, that's, that's a, a very deep thing philosophically for me. But when you say philosophy, I, I really would like to use that word in the literal sense. It really means the love of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It isn't a command of great thoughts or a command of great literature. It's, it's a desire for being wise. So I think every human, that's, that's a part of humanness, maybe. It's asleep in many of us, but I think we all have that potential in us. So uh, why do you think that geographers especially came away from this total feeling? Is it because we've stopped doing field work, for instance, that we all rely so much on <coughs> quantification and ready-made data offered by statistical books and so on? Mm. I, I, it's hard to make a generalization, but one thing that's true of all disciplines, I think, since they became disciplines, is that in one way or another we are little Cinderella's of nation-states. Geography is an administrative definition rather than an idea or a logical definition of thought. So once we were bureaucratically accepted as part of the university system, mm. then a whole new set of rules operated in what the discipline should do. You know, defend the national identity, uh, construe the world as that nation <laughs> wanted to see the world, and so on, you know. Uh, so geography with a big capital G is, is an administrative accident. It's an accident of social history rather than um, a consistent body of thought. Now, the body of thought, I think, it depends where you begin your ancestry. <laughs> uh, the body of thought itself uh, did retain, and still does, I think, a sense of wholeness, a sense of trying to somehow tangle with the complexity of everyday experience, much better than some of the other disciplines. Now, I don't like this competitive thing about I'm better than you kind of thing, but in the latter era, one of the most powerful influences, of course, has come from who determines research direction within the field. Mm -hmm. And that is very much a political question, where money flows for what kind of research. And by and large, it goes for specialized kind of research rather mm -hmm. than general. Nobody wants a, a guidebook to our home area <laughs> anymore. We want 
a cost benefit on alternative strategies of organizing the transport network and things like that. So of course our minds are channeled toward more narrowly defined mm -hmm. sectors. Mm -hmm. So I, I see it very much on social terms rather than, you know, ontological terms. Still, I, I think there is time now for synthesis and for reflectiveness, because mm. we need that. We've been plunged into so many details, so we should make a stop and look, what have we been doing? Mm. Let's turn to another subject. What do you mean by dialogue? <laughs> and maybe we should start, what, because now the key word of the project is really creativity. Now, mm. what is your definition of creativity? Yeah, well, we can take them both perhaps separately, beginning with creativity. Um, I begin with a definition of creation first. How does one view creation? And that is not as so much a matter of science as of myth. And if one's myth of creation is the Big Bang theory or the determinist theory, mechanistic, then one's definition of creativity is related to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I view creation as an ongoing process. I think it's ongoing and it's marvelous. You see it so in small details, in, in the things that are substantial as well as preparing a good meal, for instance, yes. in the book or in the meal or yes. everything which we yeah. do every day. I think creativity is, is the ability to participate in ongoing creation. And that can be, you know, emotional, it can be artistic, it can be intellectual, it can be, you know, my father, when he knows what kind of fellow system to use in a certain field, or, or where to locate the silo, so it, mm. it avails of the way the ground is falling, or my mother's way of preparing a meal when we only have leftovers. Mm. Creativity is taking part in ongoing creation, and I think each individual has a different constellation of potential talents. Mm. And the difficult, the objection I have to a lot of what intellectuals define creativity as is that it's product oriented and it's like the grand and marvelous opera or the big book or, you know, a bridge or something, mm -hmm. a thing, it's thing oriented. Mm -hmm. And I think creativity is, is a disposition toward life. Are you taking part in this marvelous thing of creation as who you are, mm -hmm. not who you, you're told you have to be, you know? So it's a I think I can understand that very well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's creative. It's, um, it's a matter of feeling as a whole personality and allowing all the facets of your personality to be used as yes. well as possible. And also accept that you have certain limitations, of course, and that there are always going to be some people better than you in some aspect. But that is a whole, you're yes. unique. Yes, and that doesn't mean total irresponsibility. Oh, and certainly you not. You know, the, the people, when you when they hear me saying that with American accent, they say, oh, you wild individualists, you know, there must be some social order. But this ties into what I think would be a human social order. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the part of being human is to be co-responsible for building the social uh, fabric together mm -hmm. and to have it an ongoing creation as well as physical, you know, so. Now, uh, from responsibility to dialogue, how could you take a step? Yeah, I think that the only way we can each discover who we are and what our place in the whole is or could be is by having it, checking it out with another or with some others in behavior as well as in words. Dialogue is, to my mind, uh, the ability to articulate genuinely uh, your own stance as you see it mm -hmm. and to let others articulate their stances and let that articulation, a bit like a sonata, <laughs> Um, complement and and reveal what is potentially common mm. you know they're contrasting stances and, and the worst thing is to try to compromise them into a you know a, a uniform view that has been some of my problem with dialogue here yes because yeah. the Swiss are very fond of having a discussion whose aim is to find a compromise we aren't very inclined to discuss for the pleasure of discussing mm. of uh, listening to each other listening, yeah. and um, go home and think it mm. over. I think we were very goal oriented. Mm. It must have been a shock for you when you came to Sweden. You, you discovered all this, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had many shocks, Chris. But before we leave dialogue, I think it's important that it's not yeah. just a talk shop, you know. And the difference between dialogue and dialectics, I think, is very, very important because intellectuals who know some philosophy love dialectics, mm. you know, because it's, it's purely intellectual. Mm. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, you know, and you can play that game, you know, until you're tired. But you don't necessarily reach understanding, and especially mutual understanding. Mm. So, but anyway, shocks on Sweden. <laughs>
Well, let's come back to that. Let's come back to that later. <laughs> now, what is the dialogue project? Many people have been asking me as I was working in it. And uh, sometimes I fed that little boy on these comics, mm -hmm. which I, maybe you've noticed it, I've I pinched mean... it on my wall, <laughs> but I never told you why. <laughs> I like that. I like that. But you see, Chris, what was important at the beginning was not that you understood all the complexity of it, but you had a sense of its worthwhileness. And yeah. it pitched in. And that's exactly what it does. I think it is, if you want to characterize it, it's, it's a whetting of an appetite rather than a provision of an answer. You're whetting the appetite for a broader perspective than you normally have in a particular sector. Could say. you compare it to a smorgasbord? Somebody is no. approaching? That's the National Academy route. I mean, you know, the smorgasbord is, is I think, very Swedish. <laughs> you know, here are all the products. You know, pick your, go through the supermarket. No, but I see it as a consumer. You, you look at a smorgasbord and then you say, I would like to eat and taste that and that and that. And you go on, but you have a total outlook. Uh-huh, uh-huh. No. I, I don't like that, that metaphor, Chris, because what I want is, is to allow each specialized sector to be better aware of the strengths and limitations of its own expertise. That doesn't mean, you know, well, let's begin with the problem that got it going. It was the problem of communication between specialized fields. Mm. And, you know, the way one deals with problems in social science, one builds further and further committees, which write reports and more reports on the problem of communication. And I said, well, just like I did in Glasgow, we can go back to that later. Let's see if we can't try communicating, but communicate about problems that are deeper and broader than and our separate little worlds usually mm. deal with. That go deeper yeah. than just the facts and, and such things. Yes. yes. Particularly the values, the mm. human values involved. For example, there are many common denominators between agriculture, health, housing, transport, industry, and so on, uh, which you can look at, um, which you can't look at now. You can't find what are the common denominators between our various fields. But worse than that, you have a vested interest in not finding them because there are jobs involved in the specialized labor market we have now. So you mustn't transcend your boundaries. You've got to keep your monopoly practice, as it were, on your particular stake on understanding a particular problem. So there are vested career, career vested interests in non-communication. Mm -hmm. But one isn't usually aware of that. <laughs> See? So that's one thing I want us to become aware of mm -hmm. and evaluate. Is it more important to maintain a job, even though we realize it's parasitic, that we're parasites on society because we need to be called in as consultants on our particular aspect of that issue? Mm. We know there'll be 10 others competing for the same research grant to study that problem. So we all have a vested interest in having the problem survive mm. because our jobs are at stake. All right, that's a set of values. Job, mortgage on home, children, etc. Another value is to really understand the problem mm. and help to find a solution to it. But the third one, and this is the more deep one, is how can we be educators of society at large so that people can take care of their own problems? So they can understand, you know. Mm -hmm. So all of us in Nora Fjelladen, for example, could just understand one of our local problems and, and deal with it ourselves without calling in armies of consultants. So in a way, it's, it's a self-destruct <laughs> from that angle. There, there's a discern how dispensable we could really be mm -hmm. on some of that. And let's put our energies where we think is valuable. Now, I'm telling you the negative side first, mm -hmm. but I think there's a tremendously positive side as well, because specialized consultant expertise, if it's aware of itself, it can be a provoker of awareness to everything it touches. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think is the reasonable way to go. You know, we've got this structure of employment, so let's do it in a more human way and in a more intellectually uh, honest way and philosophically aware. So I th that's why we switch media, for example, from print, because I think that closes doors. Mm -hmm. It locks up thought into specialized languages and so on. Yeah, but, well, which were the main reasons to choose videotapes? Well, again, my own conversations with a number of leading planners in the post-war period, the work in Glasgow, the work in the US, work in France even, uh, to ask somebody who's at retirement age about his own life experience of a certain thing, whether it's on pollution or agriculture or housing or what have you, that gave me far more insight than reading the consultant reports on the thing, okay? Mm. And I listened to my own dad quite a lot, 
um, some retired people from the 65, <laughs> uh, and you know, there was a big movement in the 60s in the States to, to improve geographic education, and I know some of the heroes of that movement speak to them now about the costs and benefits, the mistakes and, and the successes, and you know, you get from one person who has thought about it far more than all the consultant reports possible. So I thought, why not take that approach within our various sectors? And, uh, recognize that somebody at retirement age is likely to be defensive of his point of view, apologetic maybe, or sad that he failed, all that constellation of possible things, but still to be asked to articulate it as he perceived it, mm -hmm. and not pretend to be saying, uh, this is an objective account, this is my perception of the thing. Mm -hmm. you know? And then find people with an absolutely contrasting view maybe, and give their perceptions on it. In other words, call up the orchestra from experience, reflection on experience. And so if you see the face and the expressions of somebody who is telling you that, you're more likely to, to be provoked to think critically about your own situation mm -hmm. than if you were to read the transcript of what he said. Mm -hmm. okay. So dialogue could be, as uh, very simply put, first a dialogue between retired people because they could be listening and seeing each other. But then what you really want is to evoke awareness among younger people and see how what the old people say fits into their own situation, what they could absorb and what they reject, for instance. What questions, yeah. And the dialogue is, is inside of the person. See, there has to have been a dialogue by each of these authors. He has had to have a little dialogue with himself, as it were, and his own experience. And when he appears on the screen, he demonstrates that he has done that homework. So then each of us who see it will start doing the dialogue within ourselves. See, so it's, it's many dimension. It's probably a rather hard task for many people because they have to be very honest with themselves. And uh, maybe you have to reach a certain stage of maturity be before you can do it. Well, now after one year, since the first trials on tape, which you did in April 71, and with the experience of about 30 tapes, how do you feel the media is working? Well, I have made some enormous discoveries of what I didn't know about the medium before. Mm. It, it, is, it is not the salvation. It is not the way to get around some of the basic problems we had with print. Mm. You know, uh, we haven't dealt with the problem of power, for example in conversation. And it was only when students at Nordplan told me how they saw me coming across mm -hmm. that I recognized myself, you know, that my gestures and actions and style of presenting material um, can be perceived as exercising power over people. That was a total shock to me, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I think that it may be um, a bit searing. We, we may be in beyond our depth on some of these things. I think some of the tapes have worked beautifully. Mm. You know, the Sterky tape evoked such a tremendous response from diverse sources. And some of the personalities in the history of ideas, I think they, they will be important. So I would say, in general, I'm a little worried about the sectoral ones. You know, the agricultural health and so on and so forth. Unless there's somebody from within that area who is going to take this into his own hands and make something of it. You know, I, I'm a bit Who is both a specialist and a catalysator. Yes, and a teacher, most and of all. Yes. Most mm. of all, yeah. And I think that we may be able to find a few of these, but without those catalysts who can see an interest in where they are, mm. you know, whether they're teachers or researchers or whatever, if they can't see the use of it within their present job situation, I would hesitate you know, to, to continue much more taking the initiative from our end, you know. But I'm really enthusiastic about the history of ideas part. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, that's really going to be good. Well, I think also the biography part is, is very interesting. It's a delight, it's really a delight for a student as me to see people whose book you have been reading, how they really act and how they are and so on, because it gives much more interest to the readings and you have a better clue to what happened and so on. Kind of knowing that person. person. Yes. Yeah. That's very nice, really. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I could say a little more about that, Chris, maybe on the history of ideas. I think one of the problems that has motivated me to take this route is that I have known individual people who were brilliant, mm -hmm. who were the most inspiring teachers, but they were so busy on the job. They were often the only geographer in the department, so they taught all the time and they spent hours with their students and so on. They never wrote. No. You see, so we have no written record of geographic thought, really. Mm. 
because these my own teacher, Professor O'Connell in Cork, was one. Several other I've met since, you know. <clears throat> and uh, even from history, you can see Jules Sion, for example, in the French school. You know, the name doesn't reach anything of the, the audience that other names, but I bet you he was one of the most inspiring teachers in that whole tradition. And in America, you have J.K. Wright, which, uh, whom we've just rediscovered after 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are... There are really serious questions about what happens between the moment a scholar has an idea and the time when students hear about it and how they hear about it. Mm -hmm. And in between, there are all these steps, you know? Uh, what command have you on the media? Have you the courage or the aggressiveness to insist that it be heard? And you know, the whole business of power and the communication of ideas. So I suspect that today, just like in past times, we have many really brilliant people but haven't the appropriate line of getting to the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, in modern this, yeah, this departments, help, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but in modern departments you all have also all kinds of administrative troubles because you have to courses to teach yes. and you can't put in very much of your own personality except for the way you are teaching them. Yes. But your own special interests are not very much allowed to, to be seen. There is no space for them just. Right, yeah. and I think the teaching business is mostly evoking discovery in others. It's not the content of what you shove into their heads, it's rather the thirst you can create for discovery. Mm -hmm. And that you can only do with facial expression and oral. You do it best that way. Some people write that way. You know? yes. but, but most of us don't, I think. You know? And so this is a way in which to, to get these people who have had life experience of teaching often, uh, into direct contact with students. Mm -hmm. You know the reaction to Freeman, for yes. example. Mm -hmm. And his books don't evoke that at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of them probably do. Mm -hmm. um, there was a meeting when you tried to gather all these uh, geographers from various parts of Europe in Sigtuna in June 1978. We just speak just a little about it and tell me why you did it and what you think the results were. Yeah, well, Chris, well, it's, it's very hard to... Maybe you could explain yeah. the symbol. Uh -huh. it's, it's not exactly correct, as you know. <laughs> this should be black and this should be white, I think. But um, first and foremost, I didn't do it alone, you see. And I think if I had operated a little more independently on designing it and carrying it through, then at least I would feel more comfortable about the way it was communicated. I don't think it was explained properly to people. Mm -hmm. I think a number of people got the spirit behind it, yes. but the actual mechanics, I, I don't think, were, were ever clearly explained. So it was, a, it was an experiment. It was an experiment to, with about 35 people who we both felt, Professor Hegestrand and I, mm -hmm. both felt would be open to this kind of exercise. And the, the big problem was to somehow find a way of relating the inner and the outer in thought, the reflective and the analytical. And so I designed a, a version of a journal, yes. which I myself have used for seven years or so, mm -hmm. uh, which had categories and rubrics which could be used both for um, recording data and also writing out reflections on that data. Mm -hmm. Now this process takes a whole week to learn, let alone, Certainly you know. Yes. Yes. So, but that was the idea, to sort of sh share some of the fruits of my own experience with this, because this journal has been the most helpful instrument so it's like a friend to me mm -hmm. when I take time to really do it. But you re reflect on events, on people, in terms of their meaning and significance. And uh, you allow the imagination and the subconscious and all that to sort of flow when you do your reflection on these things. Uh, it is the other side of the analytical. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the world of thought needs it very badly today. So we experimented with that. And I got a I have a tremendous correspondence with the people after. But as far as product to show, well, we'll see how David's report works out. We have a report on what's in, and I think we will get good data on the meaning of place and environment yes. for intellectual creativity. I think we won't get very much on social networks mm -hmm. because that is a very sensitive thing in mm -hmm. Sweden, you know. Um, but I think it's it's like everything else I've tried to do. The aim is to let the seed fall into the ground, you know. And, and start a process. Yes, and it'll bear fruit in its own time, but it means winter has to happen and spring and so on. So <laughs> I just hope people remember the spirit behind it rather than the letter. Yes. Um, within the dialogue project, there are very many different sectors. 
Um, how come you, you've started with so many sectors at the same time, as this is a kind of, of um, initiation to a new way of thinking and the project is rather new in its outfits and so on and seems uh, bizarre sometimes even to people. You could imagine a kind of traditional approach taking one sector and trying. Now, we've been grasping over very many things. Why are you in such a hurry, Anne? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, the problem was communication between specialized fields, mm. okay? And the method was, let's see if we can dialogue. If you start with only a small number of the range, it's likely you'll get on a course which will be inappropriate later for the others to join. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I felt we should cast the net as broadly as possible first, mm. in a very impromptu sort of way. Let's sort of fish out what might be common denominators before we begin implementing a strategy. So the, the impromptu phase was going to cover as many as we could find interesting people for, and our list was enormous. You know, we just didn't have time to get around to them. But the hope was that after that impromptu searching phase, which would be both intra-Swedish and international, we would come to some working strategy and then go in more deeply to a few of them. So that's why we've went through the impromptu you, you didn't really have any theories of hypotheses in the beginning of the work. Didn't you have a hidden so, idea? Of course, everybody does. Yes. yes. And, and that was what was that reason and rationality paper. Yes. The, the, the philosophical sort of background was that I felt since the time uh, human reason, logos, <laughs> became regarded as rationality, it was very much impoverished. And from this mythology we've built around rationality, we have uh, done some fairly gauche and, and irresponsible kinds of applied work, all with the best of intentions. See, so applied science had this great dream that by making the world more rational, mm -hmm. it would also make it more livable. So in every sector, you see the, the process of rationalization, especially in the post-war period. And in every one of them, good justification in moral terms and social terms and political terms and so on. So you had rationalization in health, rationalization in agriculture and so on and so forth and so on. So I wanted us all to get talking about that. Mm -hmm. See, not just negative critique of the evil effects, but, but just to study the human consequences of a world that has been transformed by rationalization. And that was my sort of entering um, uh, theme. But I had a much more positive view, I think, perhaps than Torsten, of rationalization, because I've seen the idiocy and absurdity of the, the pre-rationalized. What I wanted to get was some thresholds of scale mm -hmm. where we could still have a livable environment and not be too, uh, not transgress too much the laws of economics and efficiency and so on. Mm -hmm. Thresholds of scale that were workable. And so I wanted the countries that had more experience than others to tell at what threshold on the scale of rationalization do you feel you, you had an optimal sort of balance of things? Because I don't want my country to repeat mistakes that have been made elsewhere. But it seems countries want to learn their own way. Yes, <laughs> and, they seem <clears throat> to, to be like people. Each newborn baby is a new history to be done. <laughs> but this is another kind of dialogue then, when we yeah. go over to the international level. Yes. That if, if the countries are open to listen to other people's failures mm -hmm. and successes, yes. we could learn from each other. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I think that international dimension has added a lot to the Swedish conversations. Mm -hmm. The foreigners, you see, who pose questions to you here in Sweden, as it were. Then these experts who don't normally talk to each other will find, yes, we have to have a Swedish response, you see. So it, in a way, it was a, it was a cheap way of <laughs> forcing the Swedes to talk to each other. Well, um, what do you think we have achieved now during this uh, first year of common work in the project? Apart from being honest, so yes, say, errors yes. and successes. Yes, I think that what we have achieved is a lot of headache and <laughs> so on, and uh, maybe some misunderstanding. I think, in a positive way, we have created a thirst for something beyond the taken for granted. You know, among a certain number of people, mm -hmm. we have awakened uh, people's consciousness. I think a few 
let's say. And we obviously have awakened people in other countries to, and to think about a dialogue with Sweden. Mm. I'm going to Israel next week, and they're very keen on setting up a similar kind of thing. We'll interview some of these retired kibbutz streamers and so on. Mm. And that will be a way in which a level of dialogue with Sweden, which can be mutually beneficial. Yes. Then Ireland, the cooperative leaders are very interested in this thing because Swedish cooperative agriculture is so well developed and so on, and so on. So I think we have created something of an appetite. We have no product to show yet. We only have the dream which we'd like to share, mm. you know, and let people construe it as they feel is appropriate. Then how do you see the the continuation of the project. What kind of development would you like it to have? Yeah, I'd like it to take a pedagogical line. I mean, by that I mean that people who are actually teaching courses on agriculture or courses in medicine, courses in geography, mm -hmm. would design an interesting teaching units, interesting teaching units, which would incorporate some of these video interviews as provokers of awareness to their students. And then develop maybe little booklets, mm -hmm. which they could share with medical teachers or health or agriculture teachers in other countries. Here's what we tried with this group of students at our particular college, and here were the results. You know, because in many um, of the uh, sectoral areas, the problem that most professors have is specialization mm -hmm. and communication between the disciplines. Well, to provide a, a sort of teaching course which would draw the strands mm -hmm. together, and the life experience of some of these older men does that because they walked through all sectors and through all aspects yes. of that sector so i would like that pedagogical packet thing to start to, and we could do that with the history of ideas as well but i also would like a, a kind of dialogue um a kind of network of people just a people network yes. because everything begins with people Yes. And so that we can share our insights. Our project is only one way of doing it. There are many other ways. But let's share openly and freely. And, you know, that's the second. You would allow people to go on their own. If they understand the idea or, or a bit of a dialogue project, you would be very happy then if they flew by their own Absolutely. means and did whatever they liked out of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> and I would, I would be very grateful if it were done in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, let's share the results as we go along, you know, mm -hmm. and keep the antennas open to people in other countries who might be interested. Good. Well, we might be trying to do this with uh, the surroundings country to start with, I guess, and then maybe we will jump over to France or yes. we know there is something yeah. going on in life. <laughs> now I want to switch over to something which is quite different. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing a professor of geography in Oslo, Professor Ole Brun Chudi, and I'm going to put the same question to you. How is it to be a woman in an academic milieu which is dominated by males? <laughs> Oi. <coughs> well, Chris, as you know, for the first uh, 12 years, I was an it. I was neither male nor female. I was a nun. <laughs> you were a nun, yes. So I then you weren't dangerous, really. I guess. I was an it. Yes. So, yeah. mm. And I was never aware of the male-female thing. I, I really, and I still am hardly aware of it. Because mm. um, I feel the most important thing is the human person. Mm. Whether it's male or female, each of us has a different combination of qualities. And the most important thing is, is the, the human person in his or her wholeness. Mm. And I think we are male and female because we're, we're designed to complement one another. So if we've inherited a situation which is male-dominated, that's as much a deprivation for the male as it is for the female. And I think it's silly, and this is the 68 politics, the result of 68 politics that has given me this conviction. I think we are bashing our, you know, boxing our noses to spite our faces by playing sexist politics mm -hmm. with the oppressor's tools. Mm -hmm. I think we just lead to another situation of repressive tolerance and uh, denying our own integrity, in a way. That doesn't mean I... I well, I don't play politics, right? but the point is, I think that we both need a vision of what it is to be human and who we each are in all our whatever. Do you think uh, there are some special qualities which are typically female, for instance, in research and work in academic milieu? I wonder, I don't know how to answer that philosophically, but I think I do know how to answer it empirically. Yes. What kind of things do women actually do? And I have found, talking about this project, mm -hmm. that women twig immediately to what it's about. And the men keep asking me, well, now, precisely how does one set about it, you know, and what are the constraints and so on. And the women just get 
you know, the feeling of what it's about. And they say, well, how about trying this or this, mm -hmm. you know? And something I hadn't even thought about. Mm -hmm. So there may be something in us that, that has a sensitivity to gathering home and seeing how things fit, mm -hmm. you know? Whereas there may be something in the man that has, over time, we, they have cultivated the image that the man's role is mastery of the earth and order and so yes. on, leadership. But that's, that could be a historical myth that we've just managed to internalize. So I don't know how to answer it philosophically, but I think historically and empirically, we, we have cultivated different kinds of thinking. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Now, suppose I was a, a, a very young geographer. And, uh, you mean suppose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then uh, what kind of advice would you like to give to me? This is a question you've been putting to other people. I know, I know. And I say, Chris, you be Chris, first of all. And trust your own insights. Mm -hmm. Really trust them. And then see how they can be shared as graciously as possible and as co-responsibly as possible. And good luck on the job market. <laughs> because yeah. to my mind, the job market as it is it's going goes against the kind of holistic thinking that we've been trying to cultivate. Mm, that's true. Mm. Well, is there something I forgot to ask you, Anne? Oh, there always is something. We have a very unfinished conversation. I think you asked me about Sweden and I avoided the question. Yes. I think the, 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 this is a really honest assessment, I think. There's a beautiful dream and a very uh, disappointing reality behind I th the enterprise which I uh, see as Sweden in history. Mm -hmm. um, it was a marvelous dream, tremendously uh, just and good. But in implementing the dream, somehow, we, we or here, people have relied on rational means and institutional guarantees that the dream will stay alive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sclerosis. Yes. You know, it's true of church structures, it's true of unions, it's true of organizations all over. There is a spirit behind the movement, an ethos in a way, and then once it's made an institution, there's something that dies. Goes lost. Yeah, because yeah. the dream has to stay alive and open. So what I, would, I hope that somehow we can get over that. And uh, I can uh, see it in my own life too. <laughs> I think there is a, a loss of sense of responsibility in Sweden. There has been a gap, a growing gap between me and the society, unfortunately. That's and this is very important. <clears throat> well, if that's true, then that is an erosion of natural resources, <laughs> in my view, because the human capacity to learn responsibility is, is part of the civil rights package, mm. I would think. In order to be fully human, one has to not only know how to take responsibility, but do it, you know? You learn graciousness by doing it. You learn virtue in action, mm -hmm. and not by being told not to do things. So the cultivation of virtue, which is very deep, I think, in Sweden, that people are very virtuous, very concerned about perfection and obedience and, yes. and so on. Well, why not channel that basic thing toward, toward a dynamic conception of, of judgment, responsibility, generosity, mm. more room to be spontaneous, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anne. It was really nice <laughs> chat. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I babbled a lot, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Okay.